So our next panel is very uh, near and dear to my heart, and it's something that I think retirees, most of you, know all about uh, one way or another. It's called Spinoffs, the Texas Two-Step, and Consequences for Retirees, What Looms Ahead. And with that, we're going to bring in two um, panelists from the outside world, John Phelps, who's the president of GE Retiree Benefit Solutions and the longtime uh, retiree advocate for GE. And also, we have the pleasure of Carol Knotts, who is a board member of the Association of DuPont Retirees. And both of those individuals will be participating on this panel, along with Pamela Anderson. <laughs> oh, sorry. Pamela Anderson. Pamela Harrison, <laughs> Pamela Harrison, God, I always do that. <laughs> and, and what we really want to talk to you about today, and we want this to be interactive, we want to talk about how spinoffs impact retirees. So before we dive in and I start talking to the other folks and getting their, their, their perspectives, I want to just make sure you understand what the Texas two-step is. Because, I mean, it, I like it. That's why I wore cowboy boots today. But, you know, the Texas two-step involves a solvent company usually doing something in the state of Texas, creating a subsidiary, and then transferring all their toxic liabilities to that subsidiary, and then placing that subsidiary into bankruptcy. And that's why they call it the two-step. So you have a company that's solvent, they transfer their liabilities to an affiliate, and then that affiliate files for bankruptcy. Now, this has been going on for quite some time, and there's a lot of companies that have used kind of similar approaches uh, to deal with liabilities. In the insurance arena, it started with Lloyd's of London when they took on all that asbestos liability. They created a company called Equitas and they essentially transferred all their asbestos liability to this company and they, they called it in the UK ring fencing their liabilities, which basically means we're gonna leave the other syndicates alone and not tax them anymore and then this entity that we've now created, they'll deal with all the legacy liabilities even though those legacy liabilities may go on for decades. And in fact, they have gone on for decades and it was billions and billions of dollars. So the same philosophy behind kind of the ring fencing that started uh, in the UK has come to the US in the form of the Texas two-step. The good news is that there's some courts don't like it. And the two-step is often accompanied with a funding agreement from the parent. So in a recent case you might have read about involving Johnson & Johnson, they faced all this exposure for talcum powder uh, liabilities. They said it caused ovarian cancer and all sorts of other things. And so they saw that there was you know, claims coming down the pike and the personal injury lawyers were getting traction. It looked like they were gonna win a bunch of judgments. So they decided to try that Texas two-step, created a subsidiary, transferred the liabilities, put it into bankruptcy. And all of a sudden, and this is in the Third Circuit, a judge said, hold on a second, hold on a second. If the the whole scenario, including the bankruptcy, depends upon the funding of the parent. How is the company insolvent? So they kind of put a hold on that, and that's going through the courts right now, and that's put a slow to this. So my guess is they'll find some creative solution to keep doing the same thing, but at least somebody's paying attention and starting to pay attention in a big way. So um, with that said, I want to introduce um, our panelists, give them a chance to, to tell you a little bit about themselves. Let's start with um, Pamela Anderson, and I'll let her go first. <laughs> How's that? Oh, that's loud. Um, our, my name is not Pamela Anderson, <laughs> contrary to popular belief. It's Harrison. Um, I am third generation phone company worker. I graduated from high school on a Friday night and Monday morning I was working for the phone company. So uh, I, ha I have to say that there's a lot of people in my family that worked for the phone company, and you could say we're bellheads because that's what we talk about when we get together, that's, that's what we talk about. Um, my grandparents met in the phone company. My grandfather was from a family that was highly involved with the phone company. They started around the same time as Alexander Graham Bell. <laughs> and uh, I, one of my sons worked for the phone company. He just retired. And my nephew is still working there. I have a sister who still works for the phone company. But uh, when I started, I was 18. 
and I went in for my initial interview, and I was shown a book, a folder, you know, a, uh, a ring folder. And the gentleman who was interviewing me said, okay, now this is your pay, and this is your health care benefits, and here's your retirement plan. Well, I'm 18 years old. What do I know about retirement plans, and who cared? But what he said was, not only will these benefits continue with you through your career, but when you retire, they will follow you for life. So here it is. I'm at that point now for life, and my, my health care benefits have been whittled away to next to nothing. When I retired, at the time I retired, um, I think Medicare, the, the contribution you made was like $27.90, something like that. Well, that's exactly it, because that's what Verizon uh, reimburses us for Medicare. But of course, now you know, I don't even know what it is anymore. It's like $180 or $40 for your Medicare, sub, your, you know, your uh, Medicare contribution. Um, so anyway, it, the, the thing that I was told I was earning in 1965 is not the thing that I have now. It's a completely different thing. Uh, when my parents both retired from the phone company, oh, my father, I forgot to tell you this, was a New York City police officer. And when he retired from the police force, he went to work for the phone company. Go figure. And they both retired. And every time there was a new contract, they received the same increase in pay as the active employees. But that's no longer true. Since 1992, there has not been an increase in or a cost of living increase in the pension plans. So those of us on a defined pension plan have not received an increase since 1992. So if you think you can survive, if you don't have other assets on that pension, it's not happening. And yet, the executive board gives themselves very big raises. When Ivan Seidenberg retired, he got uh, $96 million, part of his retirement plan. And uh, that's about it. That's about all I have to say. Except that I forgot to thank Eddie <laughs> and his uh, staff and Tom's staff, Tom Butler's staff, and all the speakers today for doing such a wonderful job. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Thank you. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. So this is, um, we have important issues to cover. Pam, uh, Pamela hit on a number of them. But um, we're going to move along. I'd like, Carol, would you mind introducing yourself to everybody here via Zoom and tell them a little bit about you and your background with uh, DuPont? And Carol, you are on mute, so we're, there you go. Yes, I started with DuPont almost out of high school. I did two years of college, decided to, I kept trying to get in DuPont because my mother had worked there. It was a Wilmington, Delaware town. Everybody worked for DuPont practically. It was a family business and they took care of employees. They were known for that. And I started in 1971, and I was there 31 years. I had a good career. I was transferred to Germany as first woman manager at DuPont. And I joined, or I actually left DuPont um, early. I didn't get a full pension because my mother died of breast cancer, and also because I worked in a department that I felt was not doing a good job according to what I thought DuPont stood for. And that was in Teflon. It was textile fibers. And I was the manager of the production of Teflon. I visited Parkersburg, West Virginia. I saw what was going on. I knew that we couldn't get rid of the product if it, it, it wasn't sold because of its toxic uh, qualities. And I started to worry about what it was doing to the town. And then when, after being retired, I was promised benefits, of course. I never worried about it. Suddenly, when I got older and I was 
still getting the group health insurance rate of Aetna, they decided to cut our group health insurance plan, the company. And then when the company split up into the six entities, I decided to join the retirees, the Association of DuPont Retirees, because I was worried about the pension. But then last year, I had to have open heart surgery. And just before that, they decided to cut life insurance and the extra policy I was paying for life insurance was gone. And now I can't get life insurance for any rate that's affordable. So I'm worried next, what is coming for pensions? And I, all this time I was sitting there, not even thinking about people like Pam and John who are in companies that are doing this to everybody in the country, big companies. And when Ed Green, who is known for what he does, took over and with his big raises, just like Pam said, and no one cares. We are the only people that care and we have to do something. And even though I know it's very frustrating and people want action right away, the only way we're gonna do this is in numbers and try to influence how things are allowed in our country for benefits and things promised to employees for their livelihoods. Thank you so much, Carol. I know we've talked a lot about the life insurance issue and that being taken away at a time where in your unfortunate circumstance, you were in a situation where you couldn't get replacement life insurance. But even for people who don't have the same circumstances, it's still much more difficult and much more expensive to get life insurance when you learn about the need much later in life. And we've talked a lot today about it's, it's good to plan, but when you plan at the last minute or you plan at day zero, there's only so much you can do. If you knew when you were 25 years old um, that they were going to take away your life insurance when you were older, you know, you might have done something different. And that, to me, is the real travesty in all this. John Phelps, why don't you introduce yourself, say a little bit about your experience with uh, GE. Ah. Oh. I didn't know you. This is not karaoke. That's not till the cocktail hour. <laughs> <laughs> John, John, I hope this is your attempt at humor because the, I, I, my wife has an Alvin and the Chipmunks uh, Christmas album that I've been forced to listen to on occasion, but that's about what you sound like. <laughs> John, we can't hear a thing you're saying. So uh, we're going to skip John, and we're going to go. We're going to go back to the agenda. We hope to come back to him. Samantha's going to somehow, with Austin, figure out what I can do, if anything. But in the meantime, I think I just want to talk about a couple of issues, and then get the perspective of um, Pamela and, and Carol and John. Hopefully, you'll hear, and maybe you can answer later. So, you know, what I've learned from working for um, retiree groups and, and individual retirees over the past decade is a lot of the folks you know, really loved their employers. They really loved their work. It wasn't always that they loved every minute of what they did and they, that they couldn't wait to go to work. I know some people like Tommy Steed told me the first question every day was where are we having lunch? But that's still, you know, it's a social environment. And people miss the camaraderie and they miss the community that they had when they worked for these companies when, people, when, they, when, the, when the corporate executives took care of their own. Everyone I've talked to from these big companies, these noble companies that, 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 that you know, did great things for this country, they all told me that they traded higher salaries for bigger benefit packages. And had they known that their benefits were at risk, they might have done things very differently. And now they're presented with a situation where certain benefits are being taken away. Stolen. And I, what's that? Stolen, stolen, right. And, and some people, you know, we talked about pension de-risking and pension risk transfer. Some people prefer the word pension stripping. I wonder what you guys think about that. Yes, okay. exactly. P Pamela Anderson likes that. That's okay. right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's a, I, set her, I set her up. Okay, so, no, but anyhow, the, the, what I think would be interesting to hear from, from Pamela and also from Carol 
and uh, maybe Alvin and the Chipmunks. You know, what, what benefits really being taken away hurt you the most today? Well, I'll, I'll have to say, like, health care. Yeah. I feel like I can't afford some of the things that I used to be able to uh, do. And I find myself putting off doctor's appointments. And I, uh, I especially, I don't like, we have a, 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 medic, a Medicare Advantage plan. And I don't like that at all, not even a little bit. I would prefer to have uh, original Medicare with maybe a supplement. Um, but that's what the company offered. And for some reason, I took it. And I'm sorry. So I'm sorry I did. But Pamela, he, I mean, I think everybody here needs to understand the way the law has evolved, which is unfortunate. But health care benefits and life insurance benefits are considered welfare benefits. Mm -hmm. And so corporations who have very broad reservation of rights clause, clauses written into their plan documents where they reserve the right to amend or terminate the, the plan mm -hmm. at any time. Right. Uh, the courts have upheld their making changes to welfare benefits. Mm -hmm. The one benefit that you're not supposed to be able to change is a vested pension benefit. That's why I'm so concerned about this pension risk transfer stuff because that's supposed to be the holy grail. You're not supposed to be able to touch that. There's a provision in ERISA known as the anti-cutback rule, which means once a benefit is vested, it cannot be taken away. But by transferring it to an insurance company, you can. And the way that that happens, and I, I know this is technical, but I'll try and explain this as best I can. You know, the decision to amend or terminate a pension plan, a pension and retirement plan, it's not a fiduciary decision. It's called a set law decision or an administrative decision, which means the person making that decision is not held to the standard of a fiduciary. Frankly, to me, that makes no sense at all. You can be sued for breach of fiduciary duty for choosing a bad stock to invest in, but you can kick 41,000 people out of a pension plan, and you can't be sued for breach of fiduciary duty because you're not a fiduciary. That is one thing that us, we as retiree advocates, and you as retirees can change. Carol, what about you? Well, I joined because my biggest fear, knowing what was happening with the group life insurance, and now the I joined before I realized they were going to get rid of, I said group life insurance. I meant to say group health care, the Aetna plan. That was before we went on Medicare. They cut everybody. We had to go to meetings in Wilmington, and they explained how to get through their exchange a policy for those that can go on Medicare. And I even went to the government about what they were doing with the exchange because what they were doing, can't remember the name of it now, Eddie, this exchange that they had were offering a select group of supplement and advantage plans. And you had to pick from them in order to get the assistance of the annual allotment that each of us still get that I think is going to be removed as well for premiums. And I found out by talking to someone, I, I noticed they didn't have Aetna's supplement plan F and all supplements are the same. And when I found out that Aetna offered plan F at a lower rate, I said, why isn't Aetna included in this group that DuPont had their exchange offering? So I found a man in Aetna that said, we should be on there. We're not on there. And it led me to find out that, and I couldn't prove it, but right after I raised a fuss with the newspaper, the radio station, everybody, they went around and said, okay, we'll give you plan F but it still wasn't on the exchange and the deadline to pick something was coming up within a couple of weeks. So everybody was forced to take something that was more expensive. And that bothered me. And that DuPont would allow this to happen. And I did complain to DuPont about it and nothing was done. And Aetna even complained to them. And after the sign up date, this exchange that was held for DuPont was including Aetna after everybody signed up. 
Right. So that told me what what companies do to manipulate, to make money, and to get things to the advantage of their employees. And that really upset me. Right. And that's why I'm worried even more about the pension, because what Eddie said is this transfer to an insurance company shouldn't be allowed, shouldn't happen, and it's not right. Well, what we talked about earlier today, um, Carol, and I agree, it's certainly not right the way it's being done, is the fact that it might transfer to an insurance company isn't the, 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 the most important issue in my mind. It's how do you make sure that those benefits get paid? That's right. the issue, right? And so what we can do, which I think we can do, is shine a light on this and make sure people are paying attention before it's too late. Um, I'm gonna try and turn now to John Phelps, so he may need permission to unmute and help unmuting, and then please put your record player on 33 instead of 78. <laughs> I hope this is working, is it? Ah, there he is. So John, tell, tell a little bit about I, your background. A little well, bit about I your background. I threw Alvin and Theodore out of the room. <laughs> anyway, uh, my name is John Phelps. I'm past president of the national nonprofit uh, key retiree benefit solutions group. That's a national group of uh, key retirees and dependents. And I say past because we dissolved the formal incorporated GERBs or key retiree benefit solutions. And we only run a Facebook group now. Uh, we, uh, as Bell tell, we're sharing about expenses and, uh, and uh, contributions. Well, we had more expenses than contributions, so we had to dissolve the nonprofit. I'm also a board member on Retirees for Justice. Uh, I worked at GE Silicones. That's a chemical plant that's in Waterford, New York, for 42 years. Uh, when I say 42 years, 35 was with GE. And then seven was with the successor employer. Uh, we got sold by GE in 2006. I think it was finalized in 2007. Uh, I retired in 2013 from GE and Momentum. Uh, the important phrase I just used there, which affects benefits is successor employer. Uh, and I'll talk more about that afterwards. Uh, I held many different positions at GE, from manufacturing to HR. I ran the EAP and benefits for a while in HR. Logistics, which is inventory control and ordering inputs and getting finished products out. I've been involved in defending the uh, GE retiree benefits, the healthcare pension, uh, the de-risking part of the pension, and life insurance since 2014. Uh, when the salary people filed the lawsuit against GE over taking away the health care, and in 2015, the unions uh, filed a lawsuit on the same situation of uh, GE taking away the health care. So that's, that's my background. Okay, so what I want to get at now um, is a little bit about spinoffs and how they impact retirees. Pamela was originally AT&T, right? New York Telephone. New York Telephone. Before, yes. It was after this, the... Oh, well before. The split happened in uh, 82, actually, was, uh, you know, that's when Judge Green made the decision to, well, the, he made the decision in 82, and it, it occurred in 84. And so after that, uh, we were 9X, right? And then at a certain point, we became uh, Bell Atlantic, and then finally Verizon. Right. So the, that's kind of the interesting part is this, it all kind of stems from, you had these big companies, they said, okay, we gotta break them up. They broke them up. Mm -hmm. that, that created all the baby bells, that created all these entities. And what they're doing is transferring assets and liabilities from one to another, not always with the same attention paid to the no. employees. One point that I would like to make is that every time the company got sold or changed its name, the uh, executive board paid themselves a bonus from those pension plans. Right. So right. just in case you're right. wondering. So, so um, Carol, um, Dow merged with DuPont, um, formed a huge conglomerate that was called Dow DuPont that existed for several years that had as its stated intention to spin off into three separate operating companies. Carol was a, a, a DuPont employee um, and she got spun off into a company that is a company today known as Corteva, 
which is a pure play agricultural subsidiary. And Carol, how much of the work that you did when you were at DuPont involved agriculture? None. Okay. <laughs> she's, she's not alone. So now her pension is being paid by Corteva. And what it looks like, and I'm not saying this is for sure going to happen, but what it looks like is they came up in a back room, got together and figured out where they were going to dump the pension liabilities and the forever chemical liabilities. And Carol talked mm -hmm. a little bit about Teflon um, and you know the combination of the pension and the uncapped liabilities that were transferred to Corteva have led me to believe that there's a real cause for concern. Corteva may not be the company that DuPont was. What do you think about that, Carol? I totally agree. I mean, for years, we've all known the, what the causes of PFOA are, and the lawsuits are piling up, and Corteva is just a scapegoat for all these liabilities, and they pushed it on them, and then putting our pension responsibility to them is just a joke. It really mm -hmm. is. And I mean, all my career, I was with medical and photo products. I was with central research. And as I said, my last job was with Teflon. And then I realized this is not a good thing. Right. And Teflon is, in my opinion, going to be the downfall of our company and our pension and everything. Right. Well, you know, just so you know, the, the, the complicated transaction, which I looked at in great detail, and there were a number of lawsuits that we filed um, trying to stop it, prevent it, or at least hold all of the different companies responsible. Um, uh, unfortunately, in today's world, if you can't show current economic harm, you can't <laughs> sue under ERISA because you don't have Article Three standing. And that's something we learned from the lawsuits that we brought on behalf of the Association of Beltel Retirees, which went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, no, if, you don't, if you're getting your benefit today, you can't file a lawsuit just because you don't think you're going to get your benefit in the future, even though all of the pension liabilities are done based on actuarial analysis. But they said, no, no current economic harm. You can't sue. You don't have standing. And that's the situation that Carol and all of her, her colleagues find themselves in now. They're watching what's going on with a company that they know nothing about that makes seed and crop protection uh, products, has nothing to do with the other stuff, and yet she's completely dependent upon them to make good on their pension obligations. Mm -hmm. And Corteva, since the spinoff in 2019, has not contributed one dime out of operating right. earnings to the pension plan. Dow, du I'm sorry, DuPont's pension plan is the oldest pension plan in the United States. The oldest pension plan in the United States. And it's been transferred to Corteva, and what used to be the parent, E.I. DuPont de Demours Inc., is now a subsidiary of Corteva. And they did mm -hmm. that so we, they wouldn't have to terminate the plan, because if they terminated the plan, they would have had to make it 100% funded. And now I'm talking to John Phelps, hopefully I'm 33 yeah. and not 78, <coughs> and I'm looking at what's happening with GE, and John, could you tell us a little bit about what GE's doing in terms of its spinoff intentions? Yeah. Um it's interesting. Uh, I don't want to skip this, so remind me that uh, they did a contract negotiation. One of the uh, concerns, obviously, was the spinoffs and how it would affect benefits. So don't let me forget about that. Uh, just a little blip from the uh, conference board that, that negotiates with GE. So anyway, GE had planned uh, to break up the business, the GE as a big conglomerate into three different businesses. Uh, G uh, Healthcare, which is already spun off. They did that and uh, started it, made the official announcement that it was in place uh, January, 2023. Now they got to do G Aviation, which is going to become G Aerospace. That'll probably happen by the end of 2024, maybe halfway through the year. And what they used to call GE Power in Renewable Energy, they're now going to call the third business GE Vernova. Now, when they spin them off, obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty about where 
Uh, what's going to happen to our benefits? Are they going to get worse and not just pensions, but health care and life insurance? Because we'll be dealing with three distinct boards, three separate entities now. We used to deal with one entity in corporate uh, health care, or not corporate health care, corporate benefits. All the retiree reps from across the country for GE, we dealt with them individually, you know, not three different distinct separate businesses. And those businesses will be run by their own board of directors and they'll make the decisions about whether they're going to continue or not continue. They tell us right now nothing will be happening. Uh, we're kind of in a moratorium until 2025. They won't make any decision because they got to put boards in place. They got to put staffs in place. They got to put benefits in place. They got to do all that. Uh, so we don't expect anything to happen until at least 2025. Now, I, I mentioned the contract, and this is what it said in the contract. Uh, three, three bullet items that they highlighted, general wage increase, you're not uh, concerned about successorship. Language that will preserve 85 years of hard-fought gains through G's uh, planned spinoffs into the three businesses. And then it says the third bullet item, no concessions on health care, retirement, or other benefits. Now, I don't know the specifics of this. This just came out yesterday. So I don't know the specifics and what, what that actually means as far as benefits or anything else. Uh, but in two years, they're going to renegotiate or start in 2025 for 2000 because they got a two-year extension on the contract as it is. Uh, they'll renegotiate. Now, what's that mean? They're going to renegotiate with each individual business. You know, that's what I think it means. Uh, but I have no specifics to say that for sure. But again, the, the thing is, with these spinoffs, I believe by G's already passed action that our future is uncertain as far as pensions and de-risking. Uh, will they make further changes to health care and uh, life insurance? They just about... Uh, killed anyway with high premiums and everything else. Right. So, John, we have to um, kind of accelerate things a little bit because we're running a little bit short of time, and I want to make sure we give people a chance to ask some questions. Since you yeah. all bring such different perspectives to the table, I just thought it was incredibly ironic that Dow merges with DuPont and split off into three companies, and then GE, kind of following the same model, figures out a way to create three separate entities and split up what is one of the biggest pension plans in the United States right now. So I think what happens you know, with Dow DuPont will be telling in terms of what's likely to happen with GE, and that's all the more reason for retirees to get, to get engaged. Now, based on what you've heard so far, does anybody in the audience have any questions? Hold on one second for Mike. Mike, sorry. Charlie Walker, DuPont, retiree, engineering department. My concern is the right about Cordova. I'll give you a little story. About two years ago, Cordova took over. I had DuPont stock, I had Cordova stock, and I had Dow stock. Well, just as when the world went to hell, they said, we're going to sell the DuPont stock, we're going to sell the Dow stock, in the spring of, I guess it was 2020, whatever it was, it had no option. The only thing you could do is you could roll it over into your 401k. But I took a, a loss of about $50,000 on the two stocks that I had. And, and I went to my accountant and he said, that's a stock market, buddy. You don't, can't do anything about that. Okay. And, and I can understand my concern is, uh, and I've been retired for 20 years, so I've, I've already socked a good bit of chunk money out of my pension plan. If I do the numbers, I've done pretty well. But but I am concerned, isn't there, isn't there some way we can stop this possibility of moving into an insurance company? Yeah. Well, so it, it, let me give you um, a little bit of insight into that, which is a great question. Can you stop it? The DuPont Pension and Retirement Plan is now 100% administered by Corteva. So DuPont has nothing to do with it. Dow has nothing to do with it. Corteva has already done two pension risk transfer deals. And in my mind, they highlight exactly what the issue is in the industry. 
they did one deal with New York Life as the insurance company. New York Life is one of the oldest mutual insurers in the country. They have a very solid balance sheet. If somebody asked me for a family member, would you buy an annuity or life insurance product from New York Life? I would say yes. Then the next year, oh, and by the way, in order to do that deal, they had to get uh, an opinion letter from an independent fiduciary that said New York Life was the safest available annuity provider. And from the earlier sessions, you know what that's all about. The next year, they did another deal, another pension risk transfer deal, this time with a theme. They didn't use the same independent fiduciary, though. They hired another one. That independent fiduciary, one year later, said Athene is the safest available annuity provider. So in one year, it's New York Life, and in the next year, it's Athene? It sounds a little pay to play to me, right? And I'm not sure these independent fiduciaries are all that independent. I understand, I understand that many of them get paid a commission based on the size of the annuity that they place. That couldn't be more of a conflict of interest in my mind. So can you stop it? I don't know, but we're going to do everything we can to try so that we can make sure that people exercise that fiduciary duty correctly in choosing the safest available annuity provider. Any other questions? Ed? Yes. Um, does hold on, the hold on one second. Hold on one sec John, hold on one second. We got a comment from the audience. Hold on one second. So, thank you. So w one of the things that Eddie and I have been talking about, and John Phelps is aware of this, we've gone down this path, and we're actually going to revisit building, potentially building our own Medicare group health plan for retirees for justice, so you won't have <coughs> a med advantage plan if you don't want it. If, it, if people want, we can order it. I'm just saying, so yes, these are issues that we're aware of, and we're going to solve this, and we're okay. going to create our own plan okay. with no stipends, and no, you have to go to this exchange or that exchange. We'll decide collectively okay. what we want okay. in the plan. All right, thank you very much. And I am excited about all that. But I want to finish this off about the, the spin-offs because the question was, can we stop it? We're going to do everything we can to try and stop it or at least make it more transparent so that when they choose an, an annuity provider, they really are the safest available. And there are consequences if they don't. That's what we're trying to do. That will take an amendment to ERISA, by the way. <coughs> Okay, I know we're running short on time. Any other questions? And I, I just wanted to add to that, that the PBGC won't transfer it, will allow a transfer unless it's, what, 80% funded? You can't de-risk unless it's 80% funded, and you can't do a plan termination unless it's 100% funded. Okay, and is there any current legislation there that, that you were working on that you mentioned, I think, earlier that uh, with one of the senators that was going through? Yeah, well, we're working on amending ERISA to, to change, number one, we're, we're working with the Department of Labor to make sure that the standards for choosing the safest available annuity provider are comprehensive and coherent. And I think we're in good, okay. good stead there, but that's the Department of Labor. With respect to amending ERISA, we want to amend ERISA to, to restore its protective purpose because I think it's been eroded over the past decade. Yes. Okay. Last, question. Last question. Hold on, wait for your microphone. And you don't, you don't, you don't win any monetary prizes okay, for this I'm, question. I'm not, I'm just, <laughs> look. He won, he won fifty bucks in the last session, so that's why. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The question is, uh, since Cordova took over our pension and it wasn't, it wasn't filled up, what is the percentage that's funded at now? Oh, that's Do a we fact. Know? Okay. Yeah. No, I know. So this is what I look at. So uh, I don't want to bore you with statistics and details, but it depends on what discount rate assumption you use. Discount rate's like an interest rate in reverse. So when you figure out what your liabilities are, you take a number and you discount it to present value and that gives you what the liabilities are. And then the assets are what the assets are. So if you use actual uh, discount rates over the past two years, it's about 80% funded. If you use the MAP21 segment rates, which they're allowed to use, which are generally higher then the plan is more like 90 plus percent funded. So it's underfunded, and how much underfunded is very much a question um, for actuaries. But I can tell you this, using fair market value rates, there is a very significant shortfall of between three and five billion dollars. At, at this time, we have a proxy vote in the system. They've said about to all of us. So everybody that's retired in DuPont should file against these decisions they're making. 
Well, actually, it would have to be Corteva now if you want to impact the plan because the plan is no longer with DuPont, well, but I completely have, agree. I have ones for every one of them, DuPont, Dow, and also for Right, because uh, in connection with the spin, they divided it into three companies, and anyone who was a shareholder of Dow got a, got a share in Dow, DuPont, and Corteva. I'm sorry to cut this short, guys, but we have a sign lady in the back, and it says, time's up. So thank you, participants, for everything that you've done. We're going to do this again. It was, a, it was a great success, and I look forward to seeing you all again soon.